now when people talk about red pill or mm -hmm. red pill men this or red pill guys that, it's usually, a, it's a very, it's a straw man typically being oh, yeah. used normally by conservatives, but also sometimes by people on the left <laughs> to like kind of just like attack I don't know, people they want to call incels or mis some mm -hmm. type of mi misogyny and these guys who hate women and they're anti-marriage mm -hmm. and they're this. It's like a straw man attack. So mm -hmm. in the same way that lots of people on the left will, they have this idea of, you know, a, a racist or a white supremacist and they mm -hmm. just kind of throw everything they don't like into that bucket. Mm -hmm. And I'm now seeing a lot of traditional conservatives even just kind of, there's this basket of icky ideas and people mm -hmm. I don't like, and we're just going to call them red pill men. And I'm just going to kind of completely straw man what that means and attack it in that way. So it's at that point where I wonder if the term can be reclaimed. It's a bit like mm -hmm. I've had this conversation with some, what I would call decent and reasonable feminists mm -hmm. who are very keen on keeping hold of the term feminism mm -hmm. and feminist. Mm -hmm. Cause they're just like, no, I really mean this as in equality and fairness, and sure. I'm not anti-man, and I'm not, you know, part of some female supremacist movement and so on. And I tend to tell them, I'm like, look, I just think the term has lost its, I don't think it can be reclaimed. The I think it's been yeah, so corrupted. The, the term feminist is, <laughs> it, I, people like identifying as a feminist yes. in the 21st century is virtually meaningless today because, and I've said this on like, I've said this to conservatives, I said this to liberals, I said, if you were born after 1965, you're a feminist. Mm -hmm. You have had some form of feminism that has influenced your thinking, whether it was in college, whether it was in school, whether it was from like, you're watching these Saturday morning cartoons, <laughs> in some way, shape or form, you have had feminist ideology just like drip fed into your your um, your influences and the things mm -hmm. that sort of like you know whether it's pop culture whether it's music whether whatever it's it just is in the air. it's just there it's in the, it's in the, it's in so the when air. so when people go well you know only 12 percent of women uh, identify as <laughs> as feminists i'm like this is a 21st century bro like yeah. just like let's can we like have a a, a, a modern conversation um, I think you're right, though, as far as the red pill is concerned. And one thing that really kind of rubs me the wrong way is a lot of people want to conflate the red pill as being sort of like the flip side of, of, um, of feminism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest straw men that the that sort of mo mostly conservatives, uh, traditional conservatives would like to conflate it as. Um, I'll get back to that in a second. But more to your point here is like, well, can we reclaim it? Can we mm -hmm. bring it back to what it is? Um, I think it's going to happen regardless because once we, you know, it'll happen. It'll happen on November sixth. Okay, is where right at the day after the election, <laughs> all this stuff just goes poof, mm. um, because ex it's exactly what happened um, right after uh, the twenty twenty election. We just got out of COVID and we just got out of all this other stuff, um, and the people were not thinking uh, about politics anymore. They weren't talking about BLM. They weren't talking about Antifa. They weren't talking about that. So suddenly, all that stuff just goes away after the election's gone, and now we have to find something else to talk about. And lo and behold, that's right about the time that Myron and Fresh started Fresh and Fit, right? Yes. January of 2021, right after the election. And so what happens is they got in, they got in at the right time. Like that's when the cycle was, was fresh at that point. Um, but as far as sort of reclaiming the name, I think what's going to, it won't be too difficult to do because so many people are abandoning it right now. Mm. So all the people who wanted to get on the red pill train and do their, either be on these podcasts or be a quote unquote red pill influencer. Now they're the best of them are red pill adjacent. The worst of them are just like, you know, throw you under the bus and we never knew you, even though they've been making gravy money off of it for the last two or three years, mm -hmm. um, just by wanting to be associated, standing in the same room with, with the red pill. Right. Um, so I think that, uh, as I said before, uh, when I was telling them, I hope it doesn't go mainstream. Uh, the, uh, once again, the reason why we even would need to reclaim the name or find some way to sort of re-identify, to re redefine it, um, is because we have had so many bad actors come in here and just basically be, be the whipping boy there. Mm -hmm. Like I like for instance, I mean one of the, one of the things I I talk about when it comes to like say Pearl Davis. Pearl Davis is the worst thing that ever happened to the Red Pill. Simple as that. Because she goes on there and her like it's like her only purpose is to be ridiculous, is to represent the red pill and be ridiculous. So people can point to her and say, that's what the red pill is. Or Tate, that's what the red pill is. Or who, like name the the worst culprits you can, whoever the straw men are that that are, are there to characterize the red pill or to represent the red pill. And it's easy to attack those one, the, those people. That's what ends up becoming the universal sort of definition of what mm -hmm. red pill is. And I'll, I've said this on several other uh, podcasts, but if there is no boogeyman, 
nobody gets paid. So there has to be <laughs> like, it used to be, I'll tell you it's funny. It's like back in 2019, the boogeyman was pickup artists. Okay. Which was kind of, I, I, it was laughable to me at the time because there haven't been pickup artists in like 20 years. This is in so, like, maybe like peak Rouge V kind of time. Well, even Rouge, I wouldn't even say that. Like oh, no. when people talk about like back then when people were talking about like they were sort of making the straw man was PUAs, right? Okay. And so they're, they would conjure this image of like say mystery and like, you know, like a, a top hat yeah. <laughs> and like a feather boa and black fingernail yeah. polish. And he's got this, you know, digital, you know, reader on his things and, and he's in elevator <laughs> boots. And that's, yeah, it's like, we, we can laugh yeah, about yeah. it even today, right? Because it's ridiculous. But that's what people were saying. Oh, you wouldn't want to be like that. You want to be a traditional man and have a wife and 4.5 kids. And, you know, and that now, of course, now we're pointing at like guys like Dan Bilzerian or people who are like living the life with like, you know, their are single with a lot of women mm -hmm. versus the family man with one woman and a lot of kids, right? So now we're sort of pitting those two together. But as I said, I think probably once the election cycle is over, the, that conversation is not going to carry the same water that it does right now. Yeah, that'll be interesting. So there are a lot of people out there, a lot of people, including people I know, people I'm close to who mm -hmm. have the idea that red pill is an ideology that's about mm -hmm. misogyny. It's about, it's anti-women, mm -hmm. it's anti-marriage. It's anti-family, it's anti-religion, and that is their genuine mm. understanding of what it means. How do you think that that happened? Uh, as I said before, they need a boogeyman. They need a straw man that they can point and sputter at. Uh, there's it, it kind of depends on the accounts because I see a lot of I see a lot of uh, personalities sort of come into the space and it's a very it's it's easy pickings mm. to to jump into the manosphere and say those guys are ridiculous but my religion says that this is the way to go and it's like well then that's what is it it's Eastern Orthodox are you Orthodox Catholic are you Evangelical are you whatever it is and so but they can all agree to hate on the red pill yes. <laughs> like that's yeah. that that's the that's the whipping point right. <laughs> Um, so they can all unite. It doesn't matter what franchise of Christianity you are. We can all, we, we all agree. We hate those red pill guys. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, but again, as, as you were saying was it's, it's a convenient straw man. So, but I don't fit those molds so, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not trying to like personalize this or anything like that, but like when one of the reasons I don't get the call from, from guys like Chris Williamson, or I don't get the call from, um, uh, you know, some of these more like bigger name, uh, oh, I shouldn't say Tim Pool because Tim Pool had me on not too long ago. Um, but the reason I don't get uh, Matt Walsh, for example, or the reason I don't get uh, Michael Knowles. I think any, you guys would have such a good conversation I think too. so too. And I'll tell you what's, what's interesting is like uh, Matt Walsh just had on a good friend of mine, which is Jim Sexton. He's the divorce attorney. And by the way, you should have him on this show. I'll, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up with okay. Jim. Um, but because... Jim was a very, he and I are very good friends, right? When we've been, uh, he reads my book. I've been, uh, you know, sort of back and forth with him for a long time. And he just got on with, with Matt and was just basically just spelling out like what I would have said about like divorce and marriage and everything else. But it sounds different coming from a guy who's been a divorce attorney for like 22 odd years instead of like just me. But it's still a red pill conversation that he's having. Mm -hmm. It's just, he's, he's being educated. And so when I talk about, uh, the red pill, as I said, it's a praxeology, and people don't like it when I call it that because they think it should be more. You can't tell people information. You can't give them facts these days without telling them how to feel about those mm. facts. So Such if I, I and I, I get, in, I break my own rules all the time, which is like I got to, I, you got to give people interpretation. It's one thing to get, have stats and data. It's another thing to give your interpretation of those stats and those data. And you also can't do it in isolation. So too many people just focus on, and the red pill, like a lot of the guys who, you know, personalities in the red pill are guilty of this just as well. So when I, when I, I, I present a data point, I try to do it in correlation to other data points, mm -hmm. right? So you can't, instead of just looking at one little teeny tiny tree, you have to see the forest, right? So, um, but I'm like probably one of the few guys that'll do that because focusing on just that one tree, that's what gets you clicks. That's what gets you engagement. That's what gets you, uh, Elon bucks. You know, <laughs> that's what gets you, uh, that's what gets you, uh, you know, uh, impressions on YouTube. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's the business of all this, uh, you know, being a personality, being an influencer. And then there's sort of like having a dedication to mission, which is what I've been trying to, you know, say for a long time. But when we start talking about like, I, I hear this all the time. 
the red pill is an ideology. The red pill is a belief set. The red pill is a cult. The red pill is a religion. The red pill is a philosophy. The red pill is a movement. It mm -hmm. is none of those things. In its purest form, the red pill is just praxeology. It is just information. And as I said before, if you just give people information and you don't tell them how to feel about it, they will hate you for it. Mm. Because, or else they will insert their own interpretation and tell you what you think yep. about the information, the data that you just gave. It can be completely neutral. Mm -hmm. But they, just by the very fact of you tweeting it out or relating it on Substack, or, or well, I'm a writer, so I go to Substack, but if, or you put it on your podcast or something, people want to fill in the blanks that you left out just yes. by giving them that data. So if you don't tell them how to, you, how to feel about it, then they're either going to hate you for that or they're going to think that, oh, he must agree with me because yes. these, this data fits with my pre-existing biases. Or this, it goes against my religion and this is data. And he, the only reason Rolla will be relating this is because he hates God, mm -hmm. right? Or he hates this religion or he hates something else. It's like, no, I'm giving you this data so that you can use this and educate yourself. And that's really all I've ever been about. I don't give prescriptions. I'm not, I don't give advice, right? And I, it, I just had a, this happen this morning, as a matter of fact, on Twitter, where it's like, you know, this is bad advice. I'm like, dude, why do you think yeah. this is advice? If I, you're going to Twitter for life advice, <laughs> <laughs> you have a bigger problem than, than me telling you this day.